Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have the most common mistypes for the ISTJ personality type. And so the number one mistype I find for the ISTJs, especially if they're male ISTJs, is INTJ. Like a lot of my ISTJ male friends have considered INTJ in the past. It's also the most common mistype for ISTJs in general, but there are quite a few others as well that we will discuss in this panel. And so Samuel, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Hi everyone, I'm Samuel. I'm a type one in the nine. And when it comes to tri-type, I believe that would be one, three, and five in this order. Sweet, and Mark? Hey, I'm Mark uh, from Queensland, Australia, uh, civil engineer. Um, not too sure about the Enneagram. Haven't really looked into it too much, but uh, yeah, ISTJ and happy to be here. Cool, and Ryan? Hi, I'm, I'm Ryan. Um, I am ISTJ. I uh, run a personality blog with my partner, Nora, and I also don't know a whole lot about Enneagram, so I'm not really sure on that. Yeah, the most common Enneagram types for the ISTJ personality are the one, five, six, and nine. But, you know, ISTJs can be of any Enneagram type, but those are the most common of all. And Nayeli? Yeah, um, I'm Nayeli. I think I'm a type nine, not sure. Um, ISTJ and recently graduated. I'm from Southern California and I'm a research assistant. Really awesome. Ryan has an amazing website called Practical Typing. And if you want really accurate definitions of the Jungian functions, check out his website. He offers free resources to understand type. And him and Mara offer a very well-rounded take on the 16 types without stereotypes. So I highly recommend their website out. And so my first question for you ISTJs is, are there any types you have considered outside of ISTJ? What are the common types you think ISTJs mistype as? Well, personally, I, I didn't have any doubt about being an ISTJ. Like at the first very moment that I was searching about in UTI, I took the test, it was like ISTJ from the very, beginning but there's always like the the INTJ vibe that really is really appealing to I believe to not just me but all of us because like who doesn't want to be a mastermind but you know INTJ is very like strong like temptation yeah um I would agree with that I think I took the 16 personalities test which we all know is bunk but I took it back when I was very young um and very undeveloped in terms of my introverted feeling, I think. And I had gotten INFJ, I think purely because at the time I was like working in non in nonprofit areas. And so I was very kind of socially concerned. Um, and I think it must've picked up on that and given me the advocate. Um, and at the time I remember thinking that I wanted INTJ because it just felt so appealing to me. And I felt like I was way more stoic than an INFJ would be. Um, I was just projecting what I ideally wanted to be at the time, though I'm definitely not actually an ISTJ. INTJ, I mean. Really interesting story, Nayeli. And so I find with female ISTJs, they're more likely to score F on a dichotomy test because I have um, an ISTJ friend in real life. She scored INFJ as well. And I have another ISTJ friend, he scored INTJ. And so those are likely mistypes. INFJ is the most common 16 personality result too. So a lot of people get it on their first try too. And ENFP and INFP and around that jazz <laughs> when they're not. And so to keep an intellectually honest community, it's good to double check your friend's results. Like they might have an initial type that they think that they are. But if you know about the most common mistypes, maybe you can fact check it. You can go like, huh, you kind of seem like it, but you kind of don't. And then you can explore maybe potential inaccuracies with their type just to either reconfirm that they are the type that they say they are or to possibly suggest possible secondary likely types for them <laughs> to niche them in, into checking their information. Because a lot of people, when they get into typology, all they know about is the dichotomies. And that's a starting place. But to like really know and reconfirm your type, you have to know about the cognitive functions which is why it's so great to check out Practical Typing because they have really great in-depth descriptions of the functions. 
And that's how you can know if you're really the type that you think that you are, it's to know the functions. It's kind of like math. You have the right side and the left side, right? Your teacher will tell you to do the right side and you'll get an answer. And if the left side matches the right side, like, so you're also gonna then solve for the left side and see if it matches with the right side. If both sides match, then you probably got the right answer. You probably got your correct personality type. But if both sides, like there's a weird imbalance, one of the things have got to be wrong. So it's just, yeah, this theory is to kind of root out potential mistypes to make a better, more intellectually honest community. And so thanks for listening to my TED talk. So Mark and Ryan. <laughs> Uh, for me, um, I used to always mistype as INTJ and pretty much for the reasons that everyone's discussed, it's, uh, I think it's the old, um, everyone likes to think they've got a bit of foresight. And so you naturally sort of tick those questions on the, um, you know, 16 personalities quiz. Um, so, but sort of picking back, piggybacking off what Nayeli and Samuel were saying, it was pretty obvious that I was an ISTJ once I sort of started to look into those introverted and extroverted functions as well. That sort of solidified it in my mind. <clears throat> um, yeah, so INTJ and also sometimes ESTJ I'd get as well. Yeah, I find it can sometimes be hard to tell if someone's an introvert or extrovert off of first glance with some people. With some people, it's really obvious. And so, Ryan? So um, I, I have a similar story to the rest of those here. Um, I tested as an ISTJ pretty much from the get-go when I was probably 14 years old, something like that, just when I was just first getting into MBTI. Um, and I pretty consistently tested that the whole way through. But my partner, Mara, through the years, because we've been friends for 14, 15 plus years, she, being a TI dom, actually played with me being an ISFJ at an earlier point, but then later on she was playing with me being an ESTJ. So it's kind of amusing how it went from one extreme to the other as getting to know each other progressed because she initially was thinking I might be an ISFJ just because of uh, earlier on when we were friends, it was kind of, I was more reserved. Um, there was more of a limited back and forth between the two of us. So I seemed a little more docile and, and a little bit more, um, you know, uh, reserved and kind of acting nicer, I guess, in the sense that um, my, my mother's an ISFJ. So she kind of instilled a lot of kind of the ISFJ principles of how social interaction, right? So she was seeing some of those interactions because I was kind of mimicking my mother taught what you're supposed to do when interacting with other people. But as I said, years and years later, she was toying with me being the ESTJ because as she got to know me better and better, she saw a lot more of that TE coming out. She's like, yeah, okay, I, I see how it's like, yes, when you're initially dealing with people and you don't know them very well, yeah, you act very much kind of more in this um, politically correct manner and you're a lot more nice to people and a lot more um, kind of accommodating and then the more you get to know people the more you kind of that te comes out and you kind of get a little bit more well you should do this or you should do that or you get a lot more opinionated and a lot more ordering but um she always thought i was an istj but those were kind of the two directions that she toyed with just because the idoms tend to like to look at things in all the different angles and toy with them and see um what makes sense to them so that was an interesting kind of anecdote but no i i've always thought i was an icj that that's always what made the most sense to me and that's i consistently type that on the test so. that makes complete and total sense <laughs> nayeli you had something you wanted to say uh yeah just bringing up the isfj thing i like very briefly uh me and a friend a friend who knew way more about MBTI than I did and who I kind of sought out because I was having a lot of trouble pinning down my type. I actually, it took me a while to get to ISTJ, um, kind of, in, I think, in contrast to everybody else. It, it, it took like a lot of effort, a lot more research. And um, honestly, I think it took graduating college because college was so stressful that I think I couldn't, I would not be able to type myself in college. 
Um, but they briefly thought maybe I would be an ISFJ if only because of my sort of diplomatic tendencies uh, in a friend group when people are having misunderstandings. Um, I tended to play the mediator role and I really didn't like, if conflict wasn't necessary, I really didn't like it um, and try to kind of squash it. Um, I Right now, I think that's really more the nine in me, not not like actual FE. Um, I think for multiple reasons, I think my FI was just way too strong, strong enough that I actually identified as an FI dom for years. I thought for sure that I was an INFP for a long time uh, because I felt, I think I was developing and accessing my FI quite a bit throughout college and that sort of made me think I was an FI dom um, because I just felt so deeply all the time. Um, and I felt like I was a very passionate person um, but the more I looked into the actual function uh, and FI versus FE, I realized that a lot of my sort of FI tendencies were also very sort of defensive um, and borderline unhealthy. It was actually kind of difficult for me to use it in the more positive way that I think comes more naturally to an actual INFP um, and used it to like avoid TE a lot of the time, I think, because I had some weird past idea that my TE or my sort of competence slash planning slash follow through was not so great. Um, and I was challenged a lot growing up in that area and felt like I didn't do so well. And so I think I used FI as kind of like a justification for avoiding challenges, avoiding follow through, even though it all came to me quite naturally, I think. Yeah, yeah. that speaks volumes for sure. I actually have an ICE TJ friend in my real life who thinks she's an INFP, but I don't want to go through telling her she's an ICE TJ. So I just listen to her call herself an INFP. In our friend group, we call her the government because like she's so regimented. She has a routine for everything and she's like heavily ritual, dependable, reliable, like every ICE TJ stereotype. I know stereotypes, they don't count weight, but also sometimes they're true too. <laughs> and so like she's she's like every ISTJ stereotype, but she also thinks she's an INFP. And I don't know why that happens, but that happens for, for whatever reason. It was interesting. So I had a typing session with Nayeli and she gave a really interesting answer to when I asked her what her ideal day was. Like you listed like the literal, like the exact routines you have for each I'm moment of like your, yeah, your day. That was like intense. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> yeah what is it um saw a question once like do you happen like do you just go with the flow during a day or do you happen to your day and I definitely happen to my day um yeah, yeah. I, everything is planned out mm -hmm. yeah that's a JP dichotomy question now that we've collected all of the most common mistypes I'm wondering how we can differentiate those mistypes from the ISTJ personality We'll start with the most common mistype, INTJ. How can you tell apart an INTJ from an ISTJ? How did you know you weren't an INTJ? Well, I think the most tricky part is to understand what intuition really means and sensing. Because sometimes people just take those terms at face value and they don't try to understand. So like, when you don't try to understand really what intuition and sensing are, and you just take like the representations on the community, you'll be more, more likely to go to the INTJ. But I believe that what, what, could, what could help like a, a lot is try to really understand if you really know what intuition are, is and what sensing is. Like those are uh, both uh, cognitive functions. Not, not just like the five senses or imagination. Those are processes. So try to see those things as processes and not as one as better than the other. Like, I believe that will help a lot to know that you're not an INTJ. Yeah. What about the colloquial understanding of intuition did you relate to? So where are some possible misunderstandings that could happen? Like if you just heard the word intuition and you thought you were like an INTJ? Well, 
actually, I see that there's a correlation that people make between uh, intuition and complexity. Like anything that's like bigger needs to be related to intuition. But like complexity, complexity as I understand, is more related to like levels of understanding, like quantity, quantity and levels. So like when you can see that you can have a lot of levels in like more concrete sense then you can like separate when the complexity comes from intuition or, or not. Like this is one of the, the things like, and also like some people tend to, to mistake like intuition as real thinking. Like sensing is just like feeling things, but sensing is like to, you take the information from your five senses, then you gather to something understandable. As intuition, you take the, the patterns they are just patterns, but your your function is responsible to take those patterns and make something understandable. Like sensing is the same thing, just uses another data. For INTJ, I feel like a lot of the times the way that they're described, which I don't really agree with a lot of the way that they're described online, but that was enough for me to know that I wasn't one just because of how out there the description of the intu intuition was um i i'm pretty grounded as a whole I, I don't really relate to the whole out there thinking out into whatever into the cosmos of the quantum whatever that they like to throw into the descriptions i mean in in the practical sense if you saw an ISTJ and an intj in everyday life it would probably not be that easy to tell them apart at first glance because you're going to see the auxiliary TE in both of them. So they're going to, they're really going to look very similar between the two of them in real life. Um, really what you're going to see that I've observed between the two of them is that it's going to be how vague they end up being really when they go to explain something to you. Um, it's like the level of detail that they're going to automatically just volunteer. Like my dad's an INTJ. And that, that's one of the biggest things between me and my dad is the amount of information that you're going to volunteer if somebody asks you a question. I will be a lot more apt to give a more detailed explanation. And honestly, most of the time, probably give more information than is necessary to the person. Whereas he's honestly the exact opposite. He wants to just jump straight to the answer and not really give much of an explanation as to how to get there. You ask him a question, he's like, this is the answer. It's like, okay, well, that's great. How do I get to the answer? Like, well, that's that's on you. You figure it out. And that that's really kind of his mindset. And I think that is generally, unless they work themselves out of it, that's generally an INTJ mindset is I gave you the answer. It's your responsibility to find the path to that answer. Whereas an ISTJ, from what I've seen, that's most part, they're they're gonna give you more of a okay, well, this is the answer and this is how I got there. So like this is point B and this is point A and I did this, 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 and this to get there. And the other thing that you can look at is the, the inferior function. So you've got inferior NE versus inferior SE. Um, and again, if I was to contrast me to my dad is my dad is a lot more when he drops into that SE is going to be a lot more indulgent. Like he, if he's indulging or, or gripping or whatever, he's, 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 um, He's going out and buying a bunch of stuff. He's he's binging on junk food. He's doing something like that. When I fall into my inferior NE, it it's, doesn't really manifest for me like that. I mean, it can manifest. Like binge eating is just kind of something across the board that any type could, that could be a crux for any type. Um, but when I fall into my inferior NE, it's, it's more of a, it turns into like a paranoia or a worry type thing where I'm thinking it's like, oh, well, this could go wrong or this could happen. And then that's, that's my stress response. His stress response isn't necessarily to do that. His stress response is to like indulge on something and kind of probably get his mind off it. Whereas I'm kind of the exact opposite. And if I'm stressed, I can't stop thinking about it. I got to sit there and think about all the different things that might happen so that I feel prepared for when it does happen. So those are kind of the two things that I tend to see uh, that would kind of differentiate those two. That's an amazing breakdown, Ryan. You mentioned how an ISTJ and an INTJ, if you see them in real life, they can actually look kind of similar. And you said it's because of the TE. 
we tend to show our first extroverted function the most to the outer world. So for the ISTJ, that would be the TE auxiliary. Um, so we tend to either show the TE, FE, NE, or SE. That's the first in our stack. And that's what the outer world sees the most. And so through presentation, an ISTJ and an INTJ can actually look kind of similar on the surface. Uh, now, a differentiator word that Ryan said was the word grounded. Now, whenever I have a friend who, who's a sensing dom, who is considering maybe being like the intuitive version of their type, so with an ISTJ, if they're considering being an INTJ, or if an ESFP is considering being an ENFP, I find one of the clearest differentiators is the word grounded. Typically, an ISTJ will say, I'm learning about the INTJ. I seem more grounded than an INTJ. I've heard the same thing said from my ESFP friends who think they're ENFP. They're like, at first I thought maybe I could be an ENFP, but then I realized I'm way too grounded and too present in the moment to be an ENFP. And so I find that the word grounded tends to be a quite like differentiator word between a sensing DOM and intuitive DOM. So it, I don't know, I hear that word over and over again. So it has to mean something. It is just interesting that Ryan said that because sensing, sensing is grounded and realistic. Another point Ryan mentioned was the amount of detail that these types go into. An ISTJ might feel more joy going into the little nitty gritty details of something. With the ISTJ I know, when she's telling a story, she'll tell us like the street that it happened on or like specific details of it. And I'm like, wow, that's a very detailed way of recalling that story. So there are some ISTJs with good and bad memory, like you'll find both variants. There are some with really bad memory and some with really good memory. But I find that when they do tell you something, it tends to be detailed. And they tend to find joy from recalling the details with the story. Whereas like an INTJ might be like, all right, the details are annoying. I want to get to the point as quickly as possible. I wish I didn't have to say any of these details. So I could just tell you the NI point, the main idea, and skip over all of the sensory data. And so that fits in really well with Ryan's story about him and his dad and the contrast there. Anyone else want to share how they knew they weren't an INTJ? <laughs> I think it wasn't so much that I knew that I wasn't an INTJ, more that I realized I couldn't be anything but an SI DOM. So it sort of just cancel it out. Um, I'm way too past oriented. I'm way, I'm way too concerned with what's happened, you know, what's worked and details and, and planning in a way that I think my INTJ friend, I'm pretty sure he's an INTJ. Um, we come off very similar, I think when people first meet us um, and people, friends have joked that we're almost the same person. Um, but I think one-on-one, -on -one, it's very clear to me that I'm I, one, am not, I offer way more detail when I talk to him than he ever offers to me. I think he's very succinct and very kind of straight to the point. And he's very future oriented in a way that I've never been. Um, and he very kind of rarely draws on things that have, ha that have come before. He's very kind of, he's very visionary in a way that I admire, but that I cannot relate to. That makes sense. And so the word past oriented outside of the MBTI community has a different connotation than it does within the MBTI community. So I, I do agree that, you know, SI is past oriented in the fact that it refers back to past impressions that it's had, the subjective impressions that it's stored from events, mm -hmm. right? So it is past oriented in that extent. But I feel like someone outside of the general Jungian community might not actually know what we're saying when we say that they're past oriented. They might take it as someone who is stuck in the past, which is not true. You know, ISTJs aren't all stuck in the past. And that's why they don't relate to being ISTJs when they read, oh, stuck in the past. They're like, well, I'm not stuck in the past. And so I'm wondering, how would you define the past orientation of the SI function to a person who is learning about the functions and doesn't actually know what it means yet. How would you put it in a way that someone outside of the community would understand? For SI, the past is more as in a source of information, not, not a way to flee from a confrontation and say, okay, that happened, that must be true. I see that usually that, that 
if those things are associated, that we'll try to to always believe that something that happened will happen again, but it's not necessarily the case. It's just that we're trying to tend to seek like information that we can verify. So it doesn't mean that we're not we're closed to the, like past information. We're not necessarily biased to to the past, but we see it as more a really valuable source of information. So it can contrast with what we saw we saw and what we are seeing. So like we all have judging functions. So RTE and FI are there to help us to see when something fits and when it doesn't. So I believe that it's more kind of related to, to that. Fascinating. So you mentioned Samuel, you notice when things fit and when they don't. And I often hear that associated with introverted functions. So I wonder if one, if all introverted functions do that, if they try to figure out if things in the external world fit or don't fit with the introverted function, or or I wonder if it's your perception function or working with your judging function. So your judging function is the one that says if something fits or doesn't fit. Anyways, it could be either, but just throwing that out there. No, and no, so I believe that you that you're right. Like the 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 goal of SI is the things to fit. So like TE will help it to cut it off what doesn't like fit, but the goal is come from the introversion. I believe that you're right. Yeah, because uh, when I invite people on panels, they'll use the word fits or doesn't fit for their introverted function. Like with TI DOMs, I'll hear them saying if something fits into their Jenga tower or doesn't fit into their Jenga tower of the framework of truths that they know, right? And I hear FI users seeing if things fit or, or not fit into their value system, right? And then I hear with NI DOMs, does something fit or not fit into this vision or something that I have? So something along the lines of that. You mentioned a lot of good points, Samuel. And one of them is how you, you talked about how SI will look to the past as information. So one way you can kind of tell someone is an SI user is how much they rely on their experiences built over time. So it's not enough to just dream of it conceptually and then just believe it, that it works that way. You kind of have to have experiences built over time that it works. It's like, okay, it makes sense because there are things that confirm it in the real world. You know, there's some sort of reliability or verifiability in the real world that can actually confirm it. Sensing functions in general are more experience based. So with SI, it's experiences built over time and with SE, it's direct experiences. For SE, the, the thing is that they will not like wait if, to see that things like will come together. They'll take the they'll take the reality and they'll guess like now I see that these things are happening and there are this point that I could act. So I can choose like right now, given what I see, what I could do. That's the way they're yeah. what I see. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's like a more adaptable sense of experience. So no, it's like they don't, not. Yeah, no, go, go for it. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a SE is like less picky with its experiences. So it's more adaptable. It's more go with the flow with experiences. Whereas SI is, SI is more peculiar, particular with its experiences. Like Nayeli will have very specific routines. <laughs> like very particular traditions, uh, her own traditions, right? SI doesn't doesn't have to be like an external tradition. It's more of your own type of ways that you do things. Like my dad is an ISTJ. He likes sriracha with a certain type of food all the time. And he knows it's like the best combination, sriracha and this food. And so that's his particular ritual. And so take the word tradition loosely when people refer to it with SI. It's more like that own person's unique traditions to them and the things that they find that work the best, like the most perfected sensory experience out there and how they like recreate it over time. If that makes yeah. sense. No, yeah, <laughs> like I see like tradition as like uh, a language. Like those are things that can you, you mix and like use to express and also to get some things. So is, is, it's upon you to decide how you 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 face the the tradition and how you you will internalize it so you can use it to build your own path. It's like a well, language that we learn from our community to to build our lives. Absolutely. Well said. 
And so the next most common mistype I would like to address with you all is the FE auxiliaries. So the ISFJ and the INFJ. What are some key signs that you're not an FE auxiliary? Ryan, you have particular experience with Mara <laughs> kind of jokingly exploring that with you. What were her argumentations and how did you guys know for sure you weren't an ISFJ? <laughs> Okay, so um, the reason she was um, toying with it initially was because of the the interactions I was having with her as far as um, the, the social interaction. So I was I was kind of reserved. I, I made sure that I was kind of agreeable. Um, I kind of was holding back opinions initially and, you know, just generally trying to present myself as is nice and amiable, which I mean, ICJs could totally do that too. Um, where, where it's not like we're running around with a TE sledgehammer all the time, um, telling everybody what to do or anything like that. So it, it's not out of the ordinary for an ISTJ to be amicable. Any any person that has a certain amount of social skills can be an amicable person. But um, I think what was really kind of getting her was kind of some of the learned behaviors I had from my mother, who is an ISFJ. So kind of the way that I was approaching it was more traditionally epi. So it was kind of, I had kind of more of a helper feel to it. So it, it was kind of that, that nice jumping to, oh, well, can I, can I help you do this? Or can I do this for you? Kind of, it's that kind of attitude that you more traditionally relate to an FE user. And again, I'm not saying ICJs can't be like that. TE does like to be helpful as well, um, but it's it's a little bit different in execution. So if it ever had gotten past the can I help you phase, she probably would have seen it come out in more TE way because that's what I have. Um, because TE tends to do more of a solution-based helping, right? So um, FE kind of comes off a little more supportive where TE comes off a little more, okay, well, you have this problem and I'm pretty sure I know how to fix it. So here, you should do it like this. That, that That's kind of more of a TE approach where FE kind of, FE more, uh, more often than not, FE will come off in a softer way. Kind of, it's like FE does know the answer, but they're going to do it more like, so what if we try to do this and kind of leave it in your hands, whether you want to do that or not, where TE is a little more, I'm pretty sure we should do this. We should do this versus we could try this. You want to do this? So that that's kind of one of the areas where I see there's a kind of a FETE split. And my, my mother does lean more that way. So I have learned to kind of rein the TE back a little bit and try to make it more of a suggestion than a solution because there, there, there's just kind of something psychological there where people are more willing to take your help if you're not saying you should do this and you're more like, do you want to try this? So there are things that you can learn and take from different functions and different types and they're, they're learned behaviors, right? Uh, the cognitive functions in and of themselves is just kind of the natural way that you approach something or your mind is going to think about something. So the fact that I immediately jumped to, this is a solution, let me show the solution, is what makes me a TE user, not the fact that I do that all the time. Because I can take the FE approach and I can do that FE behavior, but I don't think like that. that that's not the natural way that I think, and that's why I know I'm not an FE user. Yeah, one time, you know, because I always give like compliments to people, like you try to give a compliment back <laughs> and you're like, oh, this is a TE compliment. And <laughs> I thought it was so funny. What exactly makes something a TE compliment versus an FE compliment, Ryan? Uh, a TE compliment is going to be more like, Joyce, you do such a good job of running this panel. It You, you execute it very well. That's a TE compliment. An FE compliment would probably be more, oh, Joyce is so sweet. She's so nice. She's such a good person. I just love being around her. She makes me feel all warm inside and she's so friendly. That's more of an F-E kind of style compliment versus a T-E style compliment is like, you do this thing very well. 
I'm complimenting you on the thing that you do really well because TE appreciates effectiveness. TE appreciates when somebody can do something effectively, if they're efficient, if they, you know, I appreciate somebody that can get something done. And I do like them to be nice too, but honestly, them being nice is secondary to them being able to get something done. Yeah, it's like saying, hey, you, you're a good resource. I literally had an ENTJ once tell me as a compliment, I view you as a long-term resource. And I'm like, I know that's supposed to be warm, but I don't know how I need, I, I don't know how I feel about this. <laughs> <laughs> what I see is one of the differences is like, when you are at a confrontation, why do you wanna like argue with the other person if you're more towards like, this will work, like we're probably using TE, like, or like, like Ryan said, like, if we're, you could do that, like if that it's good for us, you could do that, it's more like FE. And also that I noticed that I haven't, I asked a J friend that it's something that she, she doesn't want to say what is her opinion about something. I don't know if it's the same with you, Joyce. I cannot talk about you, but for me, like if there's something you wanna hide, is it that your emotions, how you're feeling or what you what you think? Like, I don't want to like people to get to know or discuss what I'm feeling about like things that are happening. I, like my feelings are just my, my, my subjects. What's my thing? Like for her, when I'm trying to discuss our opinions, she was always like very, very quiet. It was more towards to trying to express that she was with us than what she thought about the, the matter. Yeah. So as an FE auxiliary myself, what I notice about FE is sometimes like I can sugarcoat things to the point where my message is lost. So if I have to send someone a hard email where I have to like correct them with something, I might like sandwich it, like naturally put a compliment sandwich. I'm like, you know, it was so great that you did this. There's this minor thing that you could improve here. But, you know, overall, I really liked it. And the other person totally didn't get the point that they had to improve that one thing that they're like, wow, I just feel so good about myself. And I'm like, no, that wasn't the point. The point was to tell you that you have to do better with this, but I don't know how to say that. <laughs> so it is like too supportive to the point where the actual criticalness gets lost. The actual reason why I was sending the message was lost because it was too sweet. <laughs> Feeler problems. I don't know. <laughs> FE problems. <laughs> I had a friend who once came to me and asked me if I thought a certain critique they had gotten from a professor was harsh um, or unnecessarily harsh is what she wanted to know. Um, and I read it and I thought, uh, I thought it was a very useful critique. Um, and so in my mind, I was like, no, that she's, um, she's being very clear with what you need to work on later. And like, I don't know, I find that I, I, I would like to get a critique like that. Um, and all, a lot of other people around her were like, no, it's definitely unnecessarily harsh. She didn't have to say it like that. She didn't have to be so blunt. Um, and that just didn't register to me as an issue. Um, and I think a lot of the time when I'm giving critique, um, it, it's, it requires a lot of effort on my part to make sure and to like kind of adapt to who I'm talking to. Um, I know some people who will respond very well to critique the way that I do um, and who just want to know what they can do to be better at whatever it is I'm critiquing. And then there are other people who uh, need that compliment sandwich. And so I have to kind of go out of my way to do it. Yeah, that's a brilliant example. With FE, it places an importance on tone and delivery. That's probably like the really important criteria. Like it wants to make sure the way that a point is conveyed is as kind as possible. And so I, I guess with FE users or with feelers, they can be a little more sensitive. It's like, hey, that was way more harsh than it had to be. Yeah, and that's one way you can tell if you're an ISTJ. If you get a critique and you can kind of tell that it's useful, you know, you take it more for its usefulness first. And then maybe if it was said in a mean way is like a secondary thing that you process, or maybe it's something that you don't weigh at all that much. Whereas if you were more of like an FE higher up, maybe the tone would be way more important to you than the actual content of what was said. And so any other points on differentiating TE from FE? Well, the, the other thing 
and it, it's not necessarily TE versus FE, but it, it's more of the, the TE versus the TI. And, and this is another thing that Mara noted in me later, and it's like, there's no way you're an ISFJ, is the way that the TE versus TI comes off. TI tends to come off a lot less definite than TE does. So she's like, you, you, your, your opinions on things are way too definite. There's no way you have TI in your stack. You, you, you look at the other perspectives, but you're looking at it, looking for something to be wrong. So th there's a bit of a closed mindedness once I've made my mind up, I guess, that she's kind of relating to where TI tends to be a little more, well, it might be, which is why she was toying with all the different types. I am very obviously an ISTJ. There's not really anybody in my life who would think that I was anything but an ISTJ. But Mara was still toying with the, well, he could be this. What if he is this? Nobody's actually looked into whether he's this or not. So he might be that. Nobody's out and out disproved it. Everybody just generally accepts that he's an ISTJ. And that is kind of more of a TI thought process. TE doesn't necessarily think that way. It kind of has more of a, if it's not broke, don't fix it approach. So I'm not looking for things to be wrong if they appear to be right. And, and that kind of seems a little more TE in the sense it's like, okay, well, it's working, it's working fine. I'm not going to necessarily look for something to be wrong if it's working and it's working well. So that's kind of the same way that I approach my time. It's like I would discuss it with her when she was saying it, but I never really took anything that she suggested that seriously because I just knew that fit. It works. Like the FI was in there, it's like, yes, this is what I am. And that, that just kind of was kind of the end of it for me. But she was like, well, maybe you're this, maybe you're that. But yeah, that was the thing for her was like, okay, well, you don't have any of that TI in there. You're, you're not hesitant in your opinions, at least not enough for it to be a TI possibility. You, you are, you're mm. very TE in the way that you kind of present yourself. That is a great differentiator. I wish I had more of a confident type of stating of my opinions, but I always kind of like to doubt them too. Because I always like like to infuse a bit of doubt with all of my opinions. It doesn't matter how closely I hold it. I will always like to doubt it to a certain extent too. Me and my friend Denzel Mensa, we do this thing where we have a secondary and a third type for most people just because we like to. Because we like to... S Think about, okay, if, if they were wrong about that, and pe most people are wrong about this, what would be the second most likely hypothesis for this? And what would be the third most likely hypothesis for this? It's just like a really fun TI, TI experiment to see how far you can take the logic. It's almost like, how interesting of a Jenga tower can you build with this? It's not about whether it can work or not. It's about whether or not you can build the explanation that makes the most sense. And to do that, you have to kind of have backup explanations for your main explanation in case your main explanation runs, runs faulty. And so TI kind of likes to build this really complicated, intricate, elaborate TI framework or Jenga tower, just think, like to cover all the potential holes you could have. Even if they believe in their opinion, they're still going to investigate all the holes to their utmost potential. For TE, it can seem like a waste of time, you're not using your resources sufficiently to go down these these thought trails when you know it's going to be true, right? If you already know it's right, then why would you waste time to investigate something you already know is right? But TI is like, well, you can't accept that anything is right at face value ever. So we got to explore it because TI refuses to take logic at face value ever. It's the same thing for all introverted functions. All, all introverted functions want to avoid the face value expression of something. And so you'll hear more convolutedness with introverted functions because of that maybe, or at least introverted judging functions. <laughs> and so TI prefers a slow and precise approach to logic, whereas TE prefers a quick and a little more sloppy approach to logic. Well, that sounds bad, but it actually, it I don't mean it to sound bad. It, like. TE likes to get the gist of logic. And if it makes sense on the surface and it, it, and it works, then why would you overly question it and waste your time? Because that's not TE efficient at all. Whereas TI is an extremely slow and precise process. Sometimes it won't even come to a conclusion because it wants to 
really go as thoroughly as it can into something. So that that's why it's like suspended in this state of almost questioning, like Ryan was saying, you know, how, you know, everyone's certain about Ryan's type as an ISTJ, but Mara as an ISTP, just, you know, just for the, just, you know, just cause she'll go like, well, have you ever looked into ISFJ? <laughs> and it's funny. Yeah, with the introverted judging functions, FI and CI, they're slow and precise, and sometimes they don't like to arrive at a conclusion at all. They just want to be as thorough with the process as possible, if that makes sense. Like, I see that for TI, you, you guys, when you, you figure out something, you're very sure that you can use it, like, in other problems, like, confidently. But for us, we we'll have to start the, the whole process over again if the, if the problem's a bit different, or it's different, like, it needs to be, like, redone at least to reflect like the the current impressions that you have the, the problem you have to rethink it again but ti like you guys are you had thought it before it's very very amazing it, ci I really appreciate yeah it. interesting oh thank you i'll take that as a te compliment too samuel thank you <laughs> and so any other points to differentiate isfj uh and infj from the istj personality I, I mean, this this one's kind of somewhat anecdotal, but I, I find that they they move a lot slower. Just generally in in doing things, they they kind of they have more of a methodical rhythm to them versus what I do. Like if I was to compare me and my mother, the pace at which she moves drives me absolutely mad because I just want to get it done, and she's a lot more methodical with it which means in the end, she probably technically did a better job because she took her time and just did it real slow and made sure she got every last little thing done exactly the way that she wanted it. But there, there is a threshold for me. It's like, yes, I want this to be done well. And yes, I want this to be done to my standard, but I also need it to be done in X amount of time. I, I cannot make this last three hours. I, I just can't. It's, that's not an acceptable amount of time. I will do it the best I can within an acceptable amount of time. And I think that kind of thought process branches out into a lot more things for me. So like my mother will talk about it. It's like, yeah, I wanted to do all these things today. And I just, I got the first one done and I just didn't have time to do the rest of them. Like I, I wouldn't do that. Like if I had a set amount of things to do in a day, they would all get done in that day. It's like, if it didn't get done quite the way that it should have been done, oh well, it had to get done. I did it. I'll go back and fix it later if it needs to be fixed. But if it had to be done today, it's going to be done today. So like that that TE in there kind of tempers my SI a little bit where I feel like the SI FE is a little bit more, no, it really just needs to be done like this. And if it takes three hours to get it done like this, we'll take three hours. <laughs> That's an interesting story. <laughs> wow, yeah. I notice the ISTJs and the INTJs to be the most private of all types. The INTJ in my real life, he makes sure no one knows anything about his like actual personal life. And I think it's like the FI, the tertiary FI is like, I wanna be really personal with my feelings. I wanna keep my feelings very really close to my chest. And so there's this insane amount of privateness around like an, an ISTJ or an INTJ with a tertiary FI, they kind of wanna protect it with their TE maybe, or protect it with, I don't know, just not, not share very intimate personal things. Cause that's, that's like for you, that's like for your FI, it's not for other people. Whereas I think ISFJs and INFJs may not share about themselves a lot, but they do it because they're focusing on the other person. So they're like, oh, what are you doing? Yeah, I want to learn more about you and, and how you're feeling and what's up with you and your state. So they're more focused on your feelings. So the ISFJ and the INFJ might do an emotional pivot to derail talking about them by turning it back on you. But I feel like ISTJs and INTJs might just be like extremely naturally private people on a whole. You know, as introverts, you know, introverts are just generally private. But I think ISTJs and INTJs take it to another level. Like with my my ISTJ dad, I don't know anything 
about him and he's my dad <laughs> I, I should probably ask but that's probably a him thing it's probably not a general type thing <laughs> but it, it just goes to show like a lot of them I actually it takes a lot to crack the shell you know it takes a lot to to get into their oozy warm fuzzy emotional side <laughs> if ever <laughs> like it's safe to show the te but maybe showing the fi is a little more of a harder feat now we will move on to the ESTJ and how to differentiate the ESTJ from the ISTJ. So ISTJs, how did you know you weren't an ESTJ? As you said like earlier, like it's generally it's quite easy to to differentiate differentiate between introvert and extrovert. But one thing that really like stands out for me is like there any like. When I see a system or a structure that an, an ESJ makes, they'll focus more on the, the control than the organization. So like I can see that they have like spots that are open for like their needs to, to work in their systems. I believe that for us, the approach is more like, I'll try to get things more organized so I don't have to control it all, all the time. But for them, I was like, if I have the control, I don't need to organize like everything. What what doesn't pass as the organization, I'll do it like myself. And yeah, they especially when they are like more older, like like their fifties, they're really the ones that I saw really crave for any like they really are passionate about it. Like, do you have an idea, any suggestion? Just give me to me, give it to me. Like especially my professors, they really really loved like when they could see like a new source of potential information out there. Well said, Samuel. Another differentiation might be energy levels too. With the ISTJ and the INTJ, I notice they have a certain amount of energy and if they expend too much, they get burnt. Whereas with the ESTJ and with the ENTJ, it's almost like the more energy they burn, the more they have. And so that energy levels could be a differentiation there too. Another one is how comfortable they feel controlling a broad group of people too. I think maybe a TE Dom might feel more comfort or an okayness when they have to step up and, you know, take care and manage a large group of people and a broad group of people. Whereas for an ISTJ, that is like maybe not as ideal. Maybe that's not a situation they'd always want to find themselves in selves in. Because like we were talking about earlier, the energy level of the type. It's like, sure, I could do that, but it's kind of taxing on my energy level. <laughs> and so ISTJs might have a more do things themselves approach, whereas ESTJs might have a more TE managing around them as well, like a broader scope, a broader scope of management in general. Ryan, we had a chat before <laughs> about, <laughs> about how you don't like it when people do things for you because they can never do it perfectly. I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but do you know what I'm trying to recall? Do you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> yeah, um, it, it it's more or less what you said. As I have, there is a certain way I expect things to be done. And that's to me, the perfect way to get it done. Ob objectively speaking, it may not be the perfect way, but that's, that's what I consider to be right. If it's not done that way, it's not right. And then I end, ultimately end up having to redo it. So it, it kind of becomes a pointless exercise for people to do things to me, depending on what it is. I mean, it, I'm not that I'm not that level of picky about everything, but, but there are things for sure that it's like, yeah, I, I just just let me do it. It's like, if, if you do it, you're, you're wasting your time, you're wasting my time. I, it, it'd just be easier if I did it. Mm -hmm. Would you say that did that... Little, <laughs> would you say that that differs from ESTJs in any way? How do you think an ESTJ would go about doing that? The the difference there, I'm not saying that they can't do that. There, there's probably still things that an ESTJ probably gets particular about, but I I would say it probably is to a much lesser degree because of what they're leading with. Because you're you're gonna see happening there is it's it's like what's the main focus, right? It's like for the SI DOM, the main focus is going to be on observation versus the TE DOM is going to be more about execution because like your dominant spot is going to basically be the top priority 
when you're thinking about something. So your, your mental energy is basically mostly going to be focused upon that top function. So execution is probably going to be at the top of a TE dominance mind most of the time versus an SI dominance is going to be more about observation. It's like, I am not one to jump straight into action on almost anything. I am much more an observation pers type of person. And if I'm put into a situation where I have to act immediately, there's more often than not, I'm just going to fail because I, I just can't do that. You know, I might get it on time two, but that's because time one, I failed. And then that gave me the ability to observe. And then the next time I'm like, okay, well, I have to act immediately. But that observation happened because I failed the first time. So it, it's kind of like there's almost a delay in reaction time for some things it feels like, at least for me, unless I've already mentally prepared myself walking into it, which is kind of where that dropping down into that any paranoia happens sometimes is like, well, I need to be prepared for anything to happen because if I'm not, then I'm not going to be able to react to it and then something bad might happen, thing that kind of happens where I don't think TE doms are probably not that worried about that. They're probably a lot more about, oh, well, I'll just handle it. Anything that happens, I'll handle it. This might happen. This will probably happen. But, you know, if it does or if something else happens, I'll just tell somebody what to do or take care of it and it'll be fine. And that I really feel like that, that, that difference in attitude is kind of one of the telltale signs probably between the two of them. Another thing is, like, I can be in charge, I can lead a group, but it's like, one of my stipulations of that is like, if you are going to force me to be in charge, you have to listen to me, period, end of the story, because I do not have the energy to argue with people under me that are not going to do what I tell them to do, and it's not worth it for me at that point, and I'm just not going to even be in charge if you're not going to listen to what I'm saying. And I feel like TE dominants probably have less of that going on. They're probably more apt to be like, okay, well, let me handle this. And then if somebody argues with me, that they'll probably get a lot more into the back and forth and like, no, do this because I told you to do it or this because this is better. It's like, I, I just, I don't have that type of energy. It's like, no, I already thought about this. This is definitely the way that we should do this. Please, I don't want to discuss it. I don't want to argue about it. Just you put me in charge, just do it. And that I feel like the ISJ probably has a little bit more of that approach where it's like, I will put out there what I think should be done. And then if it isn't taken, I'll just be like, okay, fine. And then just be done with it. And they're like, okay, fine. And it's like, I'm not, I'm not saying anything else about it. I'm not going to argue with you. If you, you do what you're going to do, um, I told you what I thought we should do. And that's the end of it. Well, that's the element also that I see that for an ESTJ, they'll, believe that people are more rational than they tend to really be. So like they are discussing with someone, they will expect the other person's like to understand their points in like contra argument that there are their points. Like for us, like our feeling is a bit more higher in the stack. Like I believe that even the undeveloped uh, uh, FI are not, not as great FI. We're more aware that people, when they get angry, they're not necessarily want to help you or to discuss with you. So to, to be very forceful as it, uh, sometimes doesn't help at all. It's like discussion not always solves the problem. Cool. And Mark? Yeah, there's certainly a couple of things I can sort of relate with um, that Ryan and Samuel sort of brought up. Uh, I think a um, really good one that Ryan sort of brought up was to do with the delegation side of things. Um, that's definitely something I can relate with. It's sometimes far easier just to do it myself as opposed to sort of, yeah, um, taking people through a number of hours and sort of building them up and, uh, um, yeah, sort of, yeah, it just can be a bit easier just to do it yourself because that way you end up with what you want to end up with. Um, I think something that sort of helped me a little bit with that, though, is uh, just uh, keep on sort of telling myself excellence over perfection and a little bit of TE, I think, you know. Um, close enough is good enough a lot of the time and I can sort of polish it up if need be uh, when delegating to others. Um, the other one, yeah, certainly agree. Um, 
when you know put into a position sort of managing others and leading others uh certainly don't particularly enjoy the constant back and forth to do with you know that the um you know the decisions been made sort of a thing but part of that i think also comes about trying to articulate why decisions been made and perhaps they're not fully aware of all the information that's sort of been um you know, been used to sort of base that decision upon. Those are amazing points. A way of putting what we were all just discussing is the firm model that personality hacker has. So EJs, the ESTJ has the fixation of management and the IJs, the ISTJ has the fixation on invulnerability. And so the EJ is going to be more comfortable with kind of like taking on the responsibility of other people and kind of also taking on a larger scope of responsibility for for a larger group of people. And they have the energy level for it, right? Unless they have a chronic illness, then that that impacts it, right? They're even, you might have a tired ESTJ if that's, this, if that's the case. But generally, they tend to be more high energy than the ISTJ. Whereas with the ISTJ, their fixation is on invulnerability. So they're going to want to be kind of protective, protective of how they want a certain thing to be done. So I guess like Ryan was talking about, they're a little more picky than the ESTJ. Not saying that the ESTJ isn't picky, an ESTJ can totally be picky as well. But the ISTJ, if you were to like aggregate them on a whole, the ISTJ would be slightly more picky and you'd see that. And they'd also, probably be more resistant to unnecessary expenditure of their energy. So whenever they feel like, oh no, that's an unnecessary expenditure of my energy, they're gonna wanna have some sort of invulnerability around that. Any other points differentiating ESTJ from ISTJ? There are interesting situations that you can get into because for instance, you can have a more outgoing ISTJ and a more introverted ESTJ and it can make it kind of hard to tell them apart at that point because typically you're expecting the ESTJ to be more extroverted in, in like the social sense and the ISTJ to be more introverted and reserved in the social sense. But that doesn't necessarily always have to be the case because you can have an introverted ESTJ that isn't as social, but if they still have that more get it done first attitude to them that does that they're probably still an ESTJ they just may not be as comfortable in the spotlight all the time but they're still going to be highly opinionated and very much about get it done first and less about the observation first um and the other thing that kind of gives it away is like the any placement like you could, there, there's actually a pretty significant difference between that tertiary any versus that inferior any. And you're going to get a lot more of the paranoia in the ISTJ of, well, I need to make sure and prepare in case this goes wrong. Where the ESTJ is not necessarily going to look at it as much that way. Like they're like, yes, we need to prepare for the things that might go wrong. But I think as a whole, it's probably going to be a little more grounded and a little more realistic than in the ISTJ. Where the ISTJ is going to be maybe trying to account for a bus falling out of the sky and destroying itself and blowing you up. The ESTJ is like, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to account for that. That, of course, I'm, I'm joking and I'm making it um, a lot more fantastical than it actually is. But it, it's that kind of thing. It's like that it, paranoid NE can take you to a place of something that could end up being really unlikely. And the ESTJ is less likely to go there. They're going to still think about all the things that could possibly happen, but I feel like as a whole, there's probably going to be a more positive spin on it than with the ISTJs. It's like, well, this could happen, but also this could happen. They're probably going to have a more balanced approach to the good things that have, might happen versus the bad things that might happen, where the ISTJ, I've found that it tends to skew a lot more to the negative. Like the ISTJ is going to put that any energy into accounting for the bad things that might happen and not necessarily waste the any energy thinking about what the good thing might happen. 
because it, it's it's a big expense on your site to use that any right so you're like well i'll only use it for the things that i'm worried might be detrimental to myself i'm not necessarily going to expend energy thinking about the good things that might happen i'm just going to think about the thing that i want to happen and all the bad things that might happen to prevent that from happening and then of course there's also the fi aspect to it where you have the inferior fi versus the tertiary fi and what i've found and it isn't across the board but it tends to be with the ones that tend to be a little more unhealthy the more unhealthy estjs they get very into trying to make themselves look that there's kind of an ego aspect to it they're kind of a little insecure in who they are so they compensate with it by going overboard in asserting themselves it's like how great i am how good i am at doing something and and there's kind of like a i'm trying to build myself up because there's kind of an insecurity there that i'm trying to bury and the istj is going to be a lot more silent on that istjs obviously can also have kind of insecurities but even if they had them they're probably going to be a lot more muted about it they're not going to necessarily try to build themselves up especially in public because you could get into an sifi loop and that would make an istj uncertain about themselves and their identity but that that loop is an introverted loop so it's going to be a lot more silent whereas with like a grip fi situation with an estj they're going to be doing everything in their power to try to stay away from that fi and try to use their te to basically bury the insecurity with competence basically so you get a lot of verbal i'm really good at this i'm really good at this and they're trying to make up for that i don't want to think about my inferior fi by building up um accomplishments wow really well articulated ryan bravo 10 out of 10. <laughs> And so because the ESTJ has an E third slot, they're also more likely to mistype as different types too. So I know a quiet ESTJ in, in my life and they actually thought for a while, they're like, you know what? I could be an ENFP or an ENTP or an ENTJ. And so they're gonna have different mistypes as well, commonly. Not always, but there's a trend towards that. And sometimes you'll catch someone off of their the types that they think that they are too. Because I, I rarely find an ISTJ telling me that they think that they're an ENFP or ENTP. <laughs> that rarely happens. But with ESTJs, that's more common for someone to identify with their tertiary function enough to consider being that type a bit. And so that's another way you can potentially spot these types apart from each other. So the last set that we're going to go through is the FI DOMs. How would you separate an ISTJ from an FI DOM type? So an INFP or an ISFP? How do you know you're not these two types? For the INFP and the ISFP, we can take like two different approaches because the INFP shares the same functions as the ISTJ. So like for the the INFP and ISTJ like difference, you could look more towards the, to what gets you out of your introverted comfort zone. If you try to think about like other possibilities, other ways to see your situation or the world, how it could be better, what you could do in the future, that's probably likely that you are in the INF, INFP. But if you are an ISTJ, you will, you will tend to try to get out of that, like thinking about things that you have to do, the goals that you have, that you own and you wanted them to succeed. So if your main reason is to like, no, I need to get things running and running properly and get successful, like, it's more likely that you are an ISTJ. For the ISTJ in the ISFP, you can look to the difference between like the sensing to SI and SE. Because of course, you can also kind of get the same difference from the INFP because the RTE of the ISFP is not that developed. 
But I believe that the sensing difference is easier to, to, to see because if you had a, a psi at a, at a, as a dominant function at C, probably should not seem so unreasonable, just different. That's the, the feeling that I have that I understand a C, I just do, don't want to do like they do things, but I, I see the reason. So for a, if you have a C, you probably want to represent the world, understand the world more objectively. You want to see what's there. If you can't see it, you, you're probably toward more VSC. But if you want to see the world, not just based on what you're seeing, but you want to really want to go further than that, you're probably towards the SI side. Because as I was trying to see that, what you're seeing right now is just like a moment, a phase. So things are, are changing. There is some consistency there. Insight uh, tends to look more for the consistency than the more accurate representation of things. Cool beans. How about you, Nayeli? I think one of the things that kept me thinking I was an INFP uh, for a while was um, one, I think just a general misunderstanding of what the functions were and what it meant for them to be stacked differently. Um, so very basic things. Um, but also, um, during my early 20s, um, I was going through a lot of sort of value restructuring and a lot of um, doing a lot of social work. And so I identified really strongly with my values and how I felt about things. Um, and I sort of saw that as my main motivation, although, uh, funnily enough, the one of the sort of problems that I had, um, pointed me towards SI in the end, because one of the things I think prevented me from doing more or, uh, acting more out of like the sense of duty that I felt that I had was my concern with my own comfort and my own sort of stability and um, a lot of a lot of what I was working on, I'm being vague, but a lot of what I was working on required a sort of reorganization of, uh, a sort of reorganization of society that frightened me, even though it fit with my values because, um, because it's something that hadn't been done before because it was so new. Um, and so even though I identified with those sort of values, um, so something like uh, prison abolition, for example, the sort of kind of radicalness of the ideas uh, rubbed up against me just wanting things to be comfortable and familiar and, and for me not to have to do uh, so much outside of my own comfort zone, which ultimately I think in the end pointed me back towards being an SI dom. Um, and I think I had a sort of realization that instead of, instead of looping SI, I was looping FI um, a lot of the time. And there was a confusion that I had um, when I thought I was an INFP. Um, so I had a lot of challenges in college that required my TE to really kick in and be efficient and, and useful and, um, a lot of follow through. And I think this might be true for some people out there that, uh, it's not, it's not only MBTI, right. That kind of influences your behavior. So you can have um, mental health problems that come out of nowhere and really kind of mess with the way that you perceive yourself and mess with your sort of natural state of being. And I think I had a lot of unresolved issues during college that made it so that I felt way more feeling than I think I naturally am. Although, again, if when I was, you know, getting those things addressed, it's funny because one of the main problems was intellectualization. I would say that I kind of understood what it is that I needed to do. And I 
had a sort of plan, but that I was uh, disconnected from feeling and I didn't want to share uh, exactly what it was I'm feeling and I didn't want to share my values um, with with people or, or be vulnerable. Um, and so and, and so I would say that another thing that differentiates INFP and ISTJ, along with sort of figuring out if you're phi psi looping or psi or SIFI looping is what your what your grip is. And I think any grip kind of really stuck out to me when I really paid attention to the functions. Um, and almost completely changed my mind on its own. Um, you know, figuring out that I'm ISTJ actually instead of INFP. Um, my T was sort of as much as I, I think, was not so, as much as I felt I didn't have great TE, I think I underestimated it a lot of the time. I think I, that was kind of born out of, you know, self-esteem problems actually, and not, not, not the reality of how I used that function, sort of how I perceived myself as using that function. And, and um, I think in having conversations with other people and comparing myself, it became very clear that I actually do use TE very easily, very often, um, even though I myself felt that I didn't use it well. And in terms of grip situations, um, I my main, issue, my main issue has always been catastrophizing. So the paranoia that Ryan would talk about, um, just the wildest things that don't make any sense um, when I think about them uh, would be on my mind um, in, you know, sort of, very stressful situations and would make me act very out of character um, because I was uh, so paranoid about, um, you know, dying from something random or, um, you know, my life being ruined because I said the wrong thing or something. Um, so just very kind of uh, exaggerated sense of threat, I think, in the world that, um, sort of reinforced my, uh, yeah, reinforced that kind of closed-mindedness, that kind of unwillingness to change things. Because if I didn't change anything, then there would be no chance for, there would be no kind of threat. Um, yeah. Beautifully said, Nayeli. When you were talking about the exaggerated sense of threat, that was spot on. And so one of the ways you can tell apart an FI DOM, well, like for INFPs, they tend to have this fantasy and they tend to have reality. Like they have an FI idealism and fantasy doesn't always match up with reality. So they tend to get like really disappointed with that because it's like, wow, you know, the, the world was such a beautiful place in my head and how I thought of it. And it's really unrealistic, right? The INFP will have a lot of unrealistic type of ways that they see the world in some way. And then when they look at reality, the reality sinks in and it comes crashing. Like that type of FI idealism comes crashing from seeing something as so positive and then crashing and then having like, a, oh no, reality sucks. Why is reality like this? It's not like my fantasy world. Whereas I find like ISTJs are a little bit more realistic. So although they might have maybe FI things, like they still have a calibration of what is reality. And so the the crash isn't as hard as it would be for an FI DOM realizing that, oh wait, the, the world isn't like it's like in my head all the time, what is this? And this is like a type of shock that my, uh, my INFP friends will mention all the time. Like they will put something up on a type of idealism and it's totally not congruent with what actual reality is. It's like a completely like different than how the world actually is like. And it's until like they actually look at reality again that they realize it's almost like each time each time they have to be reminded that reality isn't the way that their fantasy is like. Whereas I think an ISTJ might be more quick with realizing if certain thoughts are realistic or not. Like just going like, okay, like so so maybe the realism can differentiate those two types. Another differentiation that works sometimes is if this person wears their heart on their sleeve. While these FI types might feel very strongly, the ISTJ is likely to hold their cards close to their chest, so their emotional cards close to their chest. Whereas maybe for a type that has FI in either their first slot or their second slot, 
they might seem more like they wear their heart on their sleeve, at least when they haven't gotten jaded yet. So <laughs> when they're at that point of innocence where they're still like showing their heart everywhere, like with FPs, sometimes you can tell that you can see their FI. You can just like, like either with a fake, fragrantly strong opinion that they have or a rant that they're going on or like an emotion that they're holding very strongly. The FPs tend to wave around their emotions away more, but it can be also private too, because you know, you'll have a flavor of FI users that even if they're FI doms, like they'll hold it extremely close to their chest and you won't even see it. But it, the question works sometimes, like the um, seeing if someone wears their heart on their sleeve sometimes works to differentiate FI doms from FI tertiaries. Um, Cause even with people who think they're INTJ sometimes, a good question that sometimes gets them to realize that there might be a feeling type or might be an FP is if you ask them, do you wear your heart on your sleeve? Or do has anyone ever told you that you wear your heart on your sleeve? And some some FPs have been told that because they'll sometimes they'll have a really big mood swing. Like they'll be really happy one day and then really sad another day. So you'll you'll see that big like dip and high highs and lows, right? With some of the FPs, not all, because some of the FPs can be extraordinarily quiet. Like some of the FPs can be extraordinarily private with their feelings too. But this is a potential way you can figure out the differences. Any other differentiators between FI DOMs and <laughs> ISTJs? Well, I think that one difference about what you're saying, Joyce, is also that I believe that if, if something doesn't go as as you expected or, or as you valued, but it didn't happen because uh, it had a reason, like, because things work that way, like your heart will not bleed. But if you are an INFP, you probably like feel like very more profoundly than for ourselves. Like for me, if, if something works that I don't like, okay, I don't like it, but I see the, the reason. So I don't have to bother about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. Another way to possibly tell apart an FI DOM from an FI tertiary is how often they change their identity. So there are quite a like a lot of FI DOMs that cycle through ident identities. You know, they go through a goth emo phase and then they go through a hippie phase or they go through some sort of phase. FI, when it's your first slot function, sometimes it'll explore a lot of who they are, what their values are, or like, uh, and they're, they'll shift through different types of phases. I don't know, phases of their FI. <laughs> so you'll see they're like an FI dom will have a much more fluid sense of FI and they'll be like really questioning or like trying to like understand it more always. Whereas for an ISTJ, it might be more set, like their FI values might be a little more set and stable than an FI dom. And so there are some cases where you can get an ISTJ and an ISTP somewhat mixed up too, if you go off of like stereotypes. Okay, someone who loves to tinker with things, someone who likes to do things with their hands, must be an ISTP, right? Because they do all these mechanic things. Nope. You know, sometimes it could be an ISTJ or another type. And off the surface, maybe those surface stereotypes can get you to kind of go like, is this really so you could question if someone is actually an ISTJ if they do a lot of ISTP stereotype behaviors right and so I'm wondering like what are some really quick differentiators you could have to separate these two types so these two types don't share any cognitive functions they, they have the exact opposite cognitive stack so that's one thing that makes them completely different but that would take up a whole video so <laughs> I'm wondering <laughs> if there's like a quick way you can tell apart an ISTP and an ISTJ Ryan, you work with an ISTP, so you know how these types can be radically different. What are like some key things that you notice that are so different from you and Mara that just are so blatantly different? It like hits you in the face. <laughs> um, well, the most obvious one is how definite I am versus how hesitant she is. She will not say anything as a definite, unless she has sat there and mulled over it for usually days. And even after mulling over it for days, if a couple weeks she finds something else to be different, she may on the fly change that definite answer and not notify anybody about the change. 
and that that's really one of the big is that ti the ti in the lead spot it, it can look similar in some ways just because the thinkers can sometimes come off similarly because you, you get that kind of high thinking function thing you can kind of get very kind of sharp or blunt or flat answers out of people so if you're just seeing that on the surface level and not seeing really what's kind of going on behind the scenes with it um yeah you'll you'll miss that but yeah it's like the level of observation is different too she being an introverted dominant she she's still observation over action but what she's observing is completely different si dominant observation versus ti observation is like a world of difference ti is tinkering with all of the different i, I mean it's kind of like all the different angles it's like si is looking to extract all of the different details ti is looking for all the different angles it's like how does this work this way how does this work this way if if what if it's like this or what if it's over here, it's like if I move these pieces around, what what does it do to it? It's it's that kind of TI tinkering aspect of it. Whereas SI is like, okay, well, I would just want to know all all the information about this. Just tell me everything there is to know about the thing that I'm looking at. I want to absorb the information and, and I'll worry about parsing it later. TI is like parsing first, SI is gathering first. So TI will tinker with something until it realizes it it's missing piece and then it'll go and try to absorb more information and then it'll play with it some more and then it'll go get more information. I want all the information from the jump. I want 100% of the information so that when I'm toying with it or trying to figure it out, I know I have all the pieces and there's no pieces missing. TI doesn't care if there's pieces missing. TI basically assumes that there's always pieces missing and there's never a moment where you're going to have 100 percent of the pieces that, that's just kind of the way ti works it's like there's always going to be a missing piece so they're like why bother trying to gather more information until i've messed with the information i already have and, and that's probably one of the biggest differences between the istp and the istj is they're just going to try to play with things a lot more and it's just kind of be more of a i'm going to play with it now versus i'm going to research it now and, and that's kind of, it's, it's kind of weird to say it like this, but it's really the ISTP stereotype about them being more hands-on is it's kind of true. It's like, it's not that ICJs aren't hands-on, but they're hands-on after they basically put a plan together. ISTP is hands-on right from the jump. They walk up on something and it's like, oh, well, if I do this, what is this going to do? If I do this, what is it going to do? I'm, I'm not going to do that because I'm worried about if I start playing with it, I'm going to make it worse than it already was. I need to understand what's going on before I start playing with it so that I don't make it worse. ISTP doesn't really care. They're like, eh, it's already messed up. Who cares? I'm just going to play with it, figure it out. And then if I can figure it out, then I can fix it no matter how bad it gets. And that, that's probably one of the biggest differentiators. Fantastic breakdown, Ryan. Yeah. That, <laughs> that was a good spark notes on the difference between ISTGs and ISTPs. Practical typing is like the spark notes of the 16 Jungian types. <laughs> it's amazing. And so thank you everyone for coming out and telling us about your journey of the types that you've considered and the most common types that ISTJs tend to mistype as. Thank you, Ryan, for having such an accurate website that portrays the types in their true form that you're able to describe them without stereotypes, but you're able to get to the core of their cognition and why they do the things that they do. So you really pierce into the type's cognitive reasoning and you're able to describe it in a way that is both practical and well thought out. And so if you viewers want a website that I recommend, it would be Practical Typing. It's a website that's created by both an ISTJ and an ISTP and their content is stellar. It's way better than most of the content you'll find online about the 16 types. And so thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for that blessing to this earth, <laughs> that, that gift that you give us, us mere mortal human beings. <laughs> yeah, it was really nice to meet Mark and Nayeli as well, because during our typing sessions together, you both are really great at articulating your cognitive process. 
and it made it easy to type you both. So thank you for making the job easy on, <laughs> on me. <laughs> and just having that well of self-awareness, it helped with the process. And so thank you for that ability to know thyself. You guys get an A plus for knowing thyself. <laughs> yeah. It's nice, Mark, how you're able to attend this call, even if it's now 2 a.m. reaching 3 a.m. your time. That's commitment. I appreciate your reliability and your dutifulness <laughs> and your awesomeness for coming to this panel and representing the ISTJ personality. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and Samuel, it's great how you always come to these panels. Like whenever you hear an IST ISTJ panel is happening, you're like, yeah, I'm coming. You're so enthusiastic and eager. You really love talking about typology. And I love talking to people who love typology. So that's why we get along so well. <laughs> and so thank you, ISTJs, for being your wonderful selves and representing your viewpoint on the internet and really dispelling how it's like to be an ISTJ. Because when there are not a lot of ISTJs in the tech community, people kind of put words in your mouth. And so it's great that you guys are the ones putting the words in your own mouths. <laughs> so it's great that you're able to represent your type in a way that is true to the type, in a way that community direly needs. It's almost like a red pill for ISTJ content. You're able to give high quality ISTJ insights because you are ISTJs and that it's best for people of the type to kind of explain how their type is like. So we're not put through that kind of bias of the person speaking. And so I'm, I'm really thankful that you came out and took the time to explain how your cognition works and to enlighten us all about the most common ISTJ mistypes. I appreciate it. And so thank you everyone for watching. I'll see you all in the next episode. Bye everyone. Bye, thank you, bye.